So we're here today to discuss what it will take to get rural schools included in national infrastructure legislation. Where best to focus our energies around organizing and what kind of campaigning, what kinds of things do we need? There's just a lack of a federal role in, in school infrastructure in particular that I think needs to be addressed um, through both funding and we need to know more about the condition of schools. And I do think in order to really truly address this issue, we need, we need the data. Um, and someone's got to collect it centrally. Um, so I would say pushing on the, the, the federal role in addressing rural funding is one big issue to address. And then, and then the federal role in school infrastructure is the other. One of the challenges uh, that we have is while the colleagues on the Senate side claim they love all Americans. It's a numbers game. Uh, we have to create a strategy, uh, I think, as those who are concerned about rural America, uh, to, to, to offset it. The districts and states have been wrestling with reopening schools. Um, and it, it, it all of a sudden turned on to the the president and uh, Mitch McConnell and others have said, oh, we got to reopen schools. So it, it's turned political in a, in a different sort of way. But, but I think the messaging that you can't do it without more money is, is got to be loud and clear. But the reality is, is that particularly for schools in very poor condition, even if you got the marginal difference on the operating side to get more custodians or to get more technology for in school or cleaning or PPE, whatever it is you need. If you're going back to a school that's in really poor condition, you still can't do it. So, so we want to try to pull forward some infrastructure dollars for emergency repairs in the very poorest districts. Schools and infrastructure is one of the first things that the federal government got involved in. So there's definitely a way for schools to be involved in this type of broader work. Um, and I, I think people just need to know that really that is, is something that the federal government should be involved in. One of the things I think um, we definitely want to be careful of is that I think sometimes when people are looking at building new buildings or working on infrastructure, there's, there can be a desire to consolidate school buildings and to build one big regional high school because it's more efficient and it's cheaper. And that tends to be very devastating for rural communities and we would not want to try to support, I wouldn't anyway, um, funding for buildings that closes small community schools and pushes, creates big, huge schools. This immediate opportunity to put out a message that encapsulates short-term and long-term needs and we're talking about when it comes to schools. We've got all of this conversation that's going on now about school reopening, but it's mostly about how our children, how they're gonna separate the children, how they're gonna transport the children, how they're gonna do the testing, how they're gonna do all of this stuff. It is not about we're sending children into sick buildings. People generally support education, but they don't, understand the notion that rural districts need additional help. Give you an example. Uh, I have about 30 school districts in my congressional district. The majority of them have been out uh, since March and they're talking about virtual learning. Well, 20 of those school districts don't have connectivity. So virtual learning is non-existent without you know access to that physical location because of what we're experiencing right now with COVID-19 um, and without access to broadband I mean we we have many families many children that don't necessarily have a physical space nor do they have a space in this you know society as they're quarantining in their home without that access so um, it affects everything from their education, jobs, to their health. What I'm looking for is what is that compelling idea with, that's clear and that people can get behind. You know, so much of this is really about the message, the idea, and whether people can rally behind it. 
when you talk about compelling, when, what is the compelling idea of when will we have a time as compelling as this to deal with the kind of structural inequity conversation? What we are now trying to get instituted is what we call communities of persistent poverty. Uh, if we take communities of persistent poverty as a uh, guide, then those communities who have historically been underserved would get additional monies uh, for whatever purpose, water, sewage, housing, uh, but they would get, um, I guess what we call in the country, uh, they'll get catch up money. Uh, for those years of, of uh, being underserved. So we look forward to that. Because we know in rural communities like everywhere else that poor black and brown people experience incarceration, punishment, and criminalization at the highest rate. So, so really I think being concise about that and saying when you're taking federal money out of these systems, out of policing, out of jails, out of prisons, they should be shifted into something reparative and, and underscoring education as part of that. Then these are the kinds of things that we need to do, that we have the opportunity to do, that uh, could impact communities right now and children for the long term. 